and ask questions of our uh, of our guest speakers today. Um, I think we've been pretty open with you around uh, what we've learned and some very personal stories. Uh, they were talking about his his dental bite and some of his things that he's done with uh, to correct his issues ever around uh, many different modalities that she's tried to improve her quality of life as well as Bill. And, uh, and David O certainly has some uh, interesting aspects around how imaging is, is helping us try to detect some of those things. So um, this is an open forum for you to ask questions, so please take it away. And if you have a question that you want a specific speaker to answer, then please just <coughs> mention their name. how far down the road you are. What they never tell you is, well, your myelin's disappearing. At the same time, your axons, which is the long, stretchy part of the neuron, are also disappearing, okay? So first you lose the insulation, because the oligodendrocytes are so exquisitely short of oxygen. The axons might still work for a while, but you may get a lot of mixed messages, including pain or whatever, because they're sort of short-circuiting because you've taken the insulation off. But then, if it's without well-being long enough, and that's usually oxygen and nutrients, the neuron dies, so the axon dies too. And we can reverse the process, as long as we're not all the way down to a scar. A scar being the same as if you make an incision on the skin, you get that funny white covering. Not all of that will ever completely go away. It's the same as the scar in the brain. Similarly, I think David did an elegant job, but with the optimal techniques, we can tell the difference in those two types. But does it make a difference? Because the reality is, we know what the triggering factor is. A big piece of it is hypoxia. He also mentioned oxidative stress. So I need to clear up a myth that's very common. Your doctor may say, well, more oxygen will give you more oxidative stress. That's been completely debunked, disproven. More oxygen reverses the hypoxia. It's the hypoxia that triggers the oxidative stress. Okay? So if you leave up nothing else today, that's a huge step forward. So the best way to reverse the demyelination, the first one, is more oxygen. You don't have to do hyperbaric. You can do it in the comfort of your own home with a plug-in-the-wall oxygen concentrator. It's an absolute game changer for us. And we need them because we can't get enough hyperbarics around the country. Can I come to um, in, in some of the, the papers that I studied you know, along the way, it was, it was um, talking about re remyelination. And in, in the animal studies, they caused the demyelination. And the, remyel the remyelination happens so fast and so efficiently. And then if they go back to the human model, the human condition, like, what's going on here? What, you know, the demyelination is happening, but it's not remyelinating. Like, it's, and, and so, you know, you know what my take is going to be? You didn't stop what's causing the demyelination, so why would it remyelinate? It's going to, you know, you, you know the, the, the image that I showed that you know, you're commenting on the, the, the cyclic, you know, the, the lesions come and they go away. That tells us a huge, that, that's a key. The body's really good at healing. I think that what, what we'll, we'll see is if we can move into this area where we, we can find what is the, what is the trigger. 
the other thing that the, the comment that I, I made, you know, that there's these um, systemic kind of approaches, like let's improve this and let's improve that. But MS doesn't occur like that. In most instances, there are attacks. And when there are attacks that you experience, have to look at the MRIs. There are things happening all the time. And I, I think that um, getting underneath the physiology of that, that critical area, right, you know, in the, in the neck, cranium and, and working through this, and um, that, that's what is exciting me the most right now, is these, this, uh, there's a particular uh, group, I don't know if you, Raymond Tavidian, who's that, right? <laughs> the guy who invented MRI, and I, I don't know what you know about all that history, but um, it, it was a big battle, right? Um, he, he invented MRI, and I think GE was the culprit. Somebody stole it, and he sued them and won, and um, his take now is to do upright. MR, I was gonna ask you about that. Uh, he, does, he does upright MR, which is um, completely different because your fluids are different. When you're, when you're sitting up and weight bearing, you know, it's gonna change, you know, the, the, the weight of the skull on some of those, those fine bones and muscles, and you know, that changes the flow, and um, there has been some fascinating, you just look up, um, if you Google, um, uh, Scott Rosa, R-O-S-A, and uh, Raymond Demadian, they have lots of, um, they call it CINE, C-I-N-E, where it's a movie showing the CSF, and it takes hours and hours of, of MRI time, right? But then they can show that, and then they go in and do upper cervical corrections of the bones. And, you know, I'm not saying it always happens, but some reading, right, almost like CCSVI, almost like the treatment of the jugular veins. And so, for me, when we asked the earlier question, someone was saying, um, you know, why isn't there a, a match between where the lesions are and where the patient's symptoms are? I think the question shifts when you start doing treatments like the, like, it just boggles my mind. I don't know what the rest of you do when we, we somebody like Zamboni comes along with something that's so remarkable, such a breakthrough, and, and the medical institutions do everything they can to, to bury it. Um, why not use that as a stepping off point for a whole new way of, of looking at it, which is what it should be. Um, because if we can get rid of those triggers, how many symptoms, what can you, you know, if the patient goes from wheelchair bound, has a procedure, and I think they're, who was that time? Kellen, you know, people talk about the number of symptoms that get better with doing one procedure whole conversation about which lesion causes which disability is pretty much done, isn't it? You know, we, we, when we're correcting those physical problems and the neurological problems seem to go away, I say, and this is what keeps me in this, our ability to heal is amazing. It's outstanding. If we can stop what's causing it, then let's get to the cause. That's what I feel. Okay, in, in the back. Um, seven years ago, when I walked into my doctor's office, I believe I had an MS flare, excruciating MS, of pain. I told my doctor I think it's MS. Last year, which is six years after the cat and everything going on, the neurologist said I had transverse myelitis. I didn't have MS. Six months after that, I have primary progressive MS. So in the meantime, they have me on Cymbalta, Baclofen, and now the neurologist wants me to use Ocremus. In the last year, he said there's nothing that you can do for primary progressive. So what's the downfall of the Ocremus? Because I don't have a lot of background to that. Well, there isn't any research yet at all of anything that helps primary progressive within the drug literature. God knows they've been trying, okay? And I don't think they've got any data of what they're talking about there either, for a previous, okay? Just because they recommend it, just means it's the newest kid on the block and it's gonna make the most money. It's tragic, but it's true, okay? So, and the other, is it transverse myelitis, is it MS? These are all simply names. The names aren't important, however, they give the neurologist absolute power. Neurology and the diagnosis of MS is a clinical diagnosis. They will look at the MRI, 
but they still don't actually use the MRI in the diagnosis. You must have a test. What does that do? It gives them full control, monopoly, of how the brain is diagnosed and therefore treated. This is what's slowly getting blown out of the water, and I go to great lengths about it when I talk about it in my book, because I don't, I leave the gloves off. These guys are slow to change, and people are suffering as a consequence. You know, it's not too many years ago, it was reported every time a neurologist prescribed one of these thirty to fifty thousand dollar MS drugs, they were lucky enough to get a five thousand dollar educational grant. <laughs> that stinks. And it's not legal either. However, it was discreetly done. So it's time that we voted with our feet and took back our own empowerment. There's a little yellow pill that they're saying, not MRF2, that's supposed to be good for oxidative stress. Have you heard of that pill? Well, it's, it's an antioxidant, okay? So the oxidative stress, the key trigger for it is lack of oxygen. There's not many starving Canadians, okay? So you get it from lack of oxygen or lack of nutrients or extreme stress. Go back to that old stress group. Because what does stress do? Think simply of stress raising your adrenaline, which makes your blood vessels smaller in the short term. You get, you see a tiger sitting over there. You get a huge surge of adrenaline. Your blood vessels, except to your muscles, get miniature. Remember what happens if they go down in half size? They get 1 16th the flow. And we turn into a reptilian brain, meaning we can't think, but we can run for fear. I mean, a very wise anesthesiologist taught me, walk to the cardiac arrest team. If you run through the stairwells and everything else, you can't think when you get there. And it's true. OK? So think of what the stress does how it compromises your blood flow. Lead a stress-free life? Sorry, it doesn't work. Coffins and pine boxes maybe get you there, but that's about it. So, you know, the whole thing matters. And it's back to good flow for good oxygen. Or, pump up the oxygen too. There's a question. Mary, you had a question? I'm curious about the um, intrigued by the word inflammation coming up constantly. So what can we do to relieve um, and help ourselves with inflammation? Um, I, I know, and, and I even sell a product called liquid collagen biocell, but I'm always concerned about losing weight. So that's been my mindset. But it seems like a lot of these diseases are driven by inflammation. Mm -hmm. So what can people do to help themselves with inflammation. I'm excited about that question. I, I sat in, a, in a, a sleep course for dentists, and they were taught, first of all, they, they completely blew us out of the water about building bite spoons for people who grind their teeth, because they showed us that grinding your teeth is caused by the mini panic attack. You're not getting enough oxygen into your brain, and, and part of reestablishing your airway activates the muscles of the fifth cranial nerve. You, you clench your teeth and grind your teeth. And uh, as the course progressed, um, they, they showed research paper after research paper showing that the inflammatory level, the, you know, the, the, the blood proteins, you know, tests of that, and the sleep, like sleep deprivation, increases the inflammatory load. And so, um, I, for for me, um, this is it's such a new thing for us in, in, in dentistry, and it's and it's coming from about eight different angles for us, that there's so many things I've, I've taken, so many courses this year, and I got a whole bunch of next year, and I'm 66, I feel like I'm gonna graduate someday. <laughs> but for the, uh, the time being, dentists generally are worried about paying off their student loans. You know, so they're filling, filling in hard, as hard as they can go, but the thing is, to me, if, if, a, if a person, you know, if, you're, if you're shopping, and you have a choice between a really beautiful smile and no cavities, or an 
airway. I think I picked the airway. <laughs> um, and so this is where, and, and it's not, as adults, we're talking from, from childhood on. There's so many children. Um, they're snoring, snoring like a, like a, one, I'm not downing drunkards, but the mother said that she snores like a drunkard. <laughs> and that's something that needs to be dealt with. And the whole thing about not taking out tonsils, what? You know, these kids are dying of hypoxia. Their brains are dying one cell, you know, hundreds of thousands of cells at a time because they can't get the air they need at night. And they're not cleaning it, like, you know, the whole, whole you know, clearing the toxicity and the infl inflammation. So my vote for, you know, dealing with inflammation, get your sleep evaluated. And now there's coming um, sensor, not sensors, there, there are sleep monitoring systems that dentists are investing in that they can send home with the patient, just a simple thing. We have to be careful what we call it. We can't call it a sleep test. We have to call it a sleep screening, I think because the sleep doctors will be all over us because we're dentists, what are we doing dealing with sleep? I mean, that's only the air passes through, you know, kind of close to where dentists work. But anyways, that, my vote is, is look at your sleep primarily. So the other really important part is, you know, we haven't focused on it huge today, but it's, it's huge in, in your presentation, you know, the anti-inflammatory diet. There's inflammatory foods. Okay? Get rid of them. Never take another trans fat into your mouth. Saturated fats aren't as bad as we thought they were. And the new thing is get rid of the simple carbs. Because the simple carbs trigger an insulin spike, trigger an inflammation spike. So it's a journey of each of those processes which we have control of. When I do my weekly oxygen treatment in the hyperbaric chamber, I know that that's continuing because extra oxygen reverses inflammation. People with their knee pain goes away. People with their back pain often goes away because you're reversing the inflammation, okay? The other important thing we often miss, people get, well, I've got a calcium deposit in my shoulder. Why? because the simple injury or whatever's triggered the problem in the shoulder created the inflammation. When the body has chronic inflammation in an area, it dumps calcium. You get calcium spurs and deposits. But if you reverse the inflammation with several different methods, the calcium goes away. Okay? So each of those matter, and each of the modalities matter to how to do that. And there's very good ways to go. I think the one piece we've missed today, too, is we haven't talked much. We talked a bit about genetics. Okay, so it's really hard to change my personal genetics. However, I can do huge effort for epigenetic benefit. Vitamin D enhances nearly 2,000 genes, turning the good ones on and not so good ones off. Oxygen therapy, enough of it affects over 8,000 genes. And a concentrated effort of it will boost your personal stem cells six to eight times. And the last zone of big change for epigenetics, change your microbiome, okay? Because that probably affects more than 8,000 genes. And many of those genes are factors in turning on and off inflammation. You want them working with the good switch on and the not so good switch. And one more thing, Bill, and uh, and I'll show you a Star Wars lunchbox that our engineer son built for me with 64 near-infrared lasers built into it. If you've got an engineer in the family, they might do something like this for you. If not, go visit your friendly dentist. He might have something. They have these lasers that when you have an extraction or abscess or you've just had dental work, they put it on the outside of your cheek for 15 minutes and guess what? the inflammation goes away. Um, it's incredible at draining inflammation from the body. And um, it's a very therapeutic light. It is not the hot uh, infrared sauna that Bill was talking about for detoxing. Near infrared is a different wavelength. It will not make you sweat. But what it does is it takes out inflammation. And, uh, you know, if I have 
uh, a stiff neck or if I have pain anywhere in the body, I sit that light on it and, uh, and it can reduce it or eliminate it. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm just going to ask, is there anybody who sells no. such a thing as that, or I was trying well, to find a cosmo the machine? The, yes. the gold standard on the planet is Thor yes. laser, T-H-O-O-R, okay? T-H-O-R, like the god Thor in Norwegian folklore, right? So that's the gold standard, but there's many people make lasers. There's skin treatment lasers available all across Canada because they're accepted by Health Canada. All right? Most of those skin laser will go superficial. I now access once a week a laser which is in a helmet. This is a breakthrough. We've got one in, on the island, Vancouver Island, and the other one is in the Veterans Hospital in Boston, purchased by the National Football League and used on, you know, post-concussion, PTSD, and traumatic brain injury. This will become the new standard. This fall, we'll probably get a study going on MS patients using this helmet with the near infrared in it and the lasers on the brain. We've already had a huge benefit in a Parkinson's patient. It's stunning, okay? So these are research things that are going to happen, but they're in their early phases, completely without downside. <clears throat> If we think every single brain illness, big money on Alzheimer's, big money on Parkinson's, big money on traumatic brain injury, none of the drugs have worked. In fact, 10 years ago or less, all the pharmaceutical companies saying, we're not walking down that road anymore because it isn't profitable. None of them have worked. Why we're hanging on to them for MS is beyond me, because it's no different than all the others. Yes. I was wondering, I was hoping to hear today about um, the lymph glands in the brain, because I know they were sort of forgotten by anatomy for a long time. And I'm just wondering how that sort of fits into the whole vascular. Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned the G lymphatic slide. Okay? Right? Yeah. But and that's the lymphatic system. Okay. The G of the lymphatics comes from glial cells, which is one of the brain types of cells that support the neurons, right? Okay? And so those are primarily active during sleep, because I did mention that's why you need quality non-drug sleep. Curiously, cannabis doesn't screw that up happily. Okay? So the G lymphatics have always been there, but we didn't understand them very well, and then independent working out in Virginia and in Finland, talking about how the cerebral spinal fluid bathes the area at the night, things relax, and it literally washes pieces out. And it's part of the whole vascular connection. This is a big piece of taking away, you know, the byproducts, because the lymph system feeds into the venous system, back to Mark. Yeah, so they're actually lymph, like this. Lymph channels all throughout the brain. Yeah. That's fairly new, isn't it? Last four years. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, question. Um, I just wanted to comment on the importance of vitamin D for the body. And, um, sort of, I've heard that, um, like, the diagnosis with, uh, with MS, they're all low on vitamin D. Um, how do you. Yeah, well, you go ahead, Bill. You're the expert. I take about 10,000 a day. Yeah. <laughs> So, I used to need 12,000 units a day to keep my vitamin D measurement decent. Can you get vitamin D measurement here at your doctors in Nova Scotia? That's good. We can get it in BC, but in Alberta, it also takes an act of parliament, and so it is in Ontario. You virtually can't. It's tragic, because they just say people should take some. But vitamin D, we have known, and there's correct records, I got a whole piece on it, because if you have your vitamin D level up in the upper normal range, the upper half of normal, you will have less MS attacks. If you take at least 2,000 units a day, and you take 10, and I take 7 or 8, okay, above 2,000, it's anti-inflammatory. Isn't that a good idea? 
It also helps your vessel health all across the board. Ideally, we would call it a hormone because we can make it in the body. Most of us happen to be Caucasian here today. We make vitamin D easier. But as you get older, you make it less well. And if you put on any sunscreen, it virtually shuts it down. But here, we make it about four months a year. So people should take it year round. Get it measured, and in Canadian units, I aim for 150, but get it at least over 100 in our units, that would be 40 in American units, okay? Because it's a two and a half times factor. There is virtually no downside. There's people saying, well, you put yourself at risk. If they do that, then say, well, measure it then, okay? The other mineral that we tend to miss, curiously, we learned this in the study, was molybdenum. You don't, maybe don't know molybdenum, but you can buy it at your health food store. Most people with MS are very low in molybdenum. We found that in the study. The other thing that you can find, if you carefully look at the literature, if you have MS, you have almost zero chance of gout. Gout's caused by high uric acid crystals, okay? Uric acid is a brilliant antioxidant probably 10 times as strong as vitamin C. And if you, I measure it now routinely in people, especially if I'm thinking it may be MS, and it's usually in their boots. Their uric acid is in the low end of normal or even below normal. So they don't have the antioxidant benefit that they would like to have. You may or may not know this, your puppy dog and your cat can make vitamin C, but we as humans in a few primates can't make it anymore we probably switch to uric acid. Do I want you to go out and get gout? No, but maybe your dog can find out what your uric acid is. If it's on the low side, take a modest amount of molybdenum. I talk about that because it, it matters. The other one we talked about earlier in the hallway was lithium. Lithium helps the brain heal, stay calm. Not a big dose of lithium, 10 to 20 milligrams a day. If you need it for bipolar, you're usually on 600 to 1200. I spent two years on it, I got a tremor, but I routinely take 10 milligrams a day. And it's saved my brother's marriage because it took away his volatile anger episodes. 10 milligrams. <clears throat> Next to nothing, very healthy. Look at the studies in Texas. If you go to a town that has a lot of lithium in their water, almost no murders, wife abuse. You go to a place where there's zero lithium in the water, lots of murders, lots of white abuse. And it just goes down the line. It's needed for brain health. Uh, I want to comment on vitamin D as well. Um, in my early stages of doing the research into what was happening with the jaws and the bite, um, the, in fact, the very first study that, I, that, I, that got me interested in the connection between dentistry and MS um, they, they were talking about the, the demographics and they decided it was vitamin D exposure. But here's what's really interesting to me, and this is what focused me on that temporal suture, is that it was exposure to vitamin D up to the age of 15. And age 15 was the transition point. It's like those twin studies. If you had a twin that was born and raised in Canada and one and born in Trinidad, lots of vitamin D down there. At age 15, they trade places. The one from Canada, will remain susceptible to getting MS. The one who was raised at age 15 in Trinidad, who moves to Canada no matter what, they are immune, they will never get MS. And that was, that was a definitive study. And uh, you know what I'm thinking, right? Okay, well vitamin D is effective on so many things. It, it affects your immune system. But muscles and bones, I mean, it, isn't that what we over taught? Vitamin D is for your muscles and bones. And so um, that that trade point, and now, now they're going back and you, Sanders giving me papers on, on trauma prior to age 15. And, uh, you know, there's just so many situations, uh, you know, sp specific patient situations where um, there was a, a gymnast who had lots of cranial trauma. And he went to the dentist, and um, the guy put him in a corner, drove him and Bill, forgot about him. He had a bite block in his mouth for, I don't know, an hour and a half. They finally found him, and they, you know, he, by then he's like, you know, he's really upset. They quickly filled his teeth you know, mercury filled of course, pounded him in and sent him home. Well, his bite's jacked up. They didn't get the bite right. He goes down, lays down, and has a nap. 
This was an amazing, yeah, all the kids just adored this man. He went home and had a nap. And he said he woke up from the nap and he started to vomit. And he vomited for two weeks, couldn't stop vomiting. And um, it slowly recovered and then uh, I think it was about two months later, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And, you know, I, I mean, it was very extreme and strange, but, um, that, you know, MS is all over, the, all over the map with things like that. You know, attacks happen. And I, I interviewed Annette Funicello personally, and, um, you know, going through my theory with her, I, I've been kind of crazy about this for a long time. <laughs> and she, her story, you know, she, she's, um, she was having headaches, and she turned over one night and fell out of bed and banged her head against the, the side table really hard. And her MS symptoms started within you know, weeks of the trauma. So the, the, the point of, of trauma, the history, the, the growth, can you see how I, I'm talking about physical elements that gradually add up over time, maybe trauma kicks it over the edge or, you know, but I, I think that looking at these things and finding ways to examine that whole, it, for me it's always been bite and, and temporal bone. But now, for, I hope you got that from my presentation, is that it's, it's much bigger, it involves the tongue, it involves sleep, it involves the airway. For all of us, but I think specifically for MS, it's, it's, a, it, it's a big deal. We're hoping to see more and more of this combined efforts by you know, a dentist who's aware of the sleep problems. Um, the sleep docs, I guess we're just bashing docs today, but they just prescribe drugs or a CPAP. And guess what the CPAP does? Pulls your mid face back and gradually, you know, distorts your skull and reduces the airway. I had a CPAP for 20 years and it reached a point where it didn't work. And so I had the double jaw surgeries where they brought my jaws top and bottom forward and no more CPAP. I, like the day I had the surgery, last time I wore a CPAP. And so, you know, it, it hasn't cured everything and there are better ways to do that that I've since learned it takes a concerted effort by multiple caregivers, the myofunctional therapy, craniosacral, osteopaths, and um, there's three or four others actually that play a big role in it. But I'm trying to bring, I'm trying to facilitate them getting together, comparing notes, and trying to make a difference.